Instruction. Do you swear from test view with the screw? The truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. May I sit for you, please? And let me get you to introduce yourself. Sorry, before I do that, can you spell your name for the court reporter? Yes, my name is Lisa. L I S A. My last name is Ellison. E L L I S O N. Um, can you tell the jury what it is that you do? Yes, I am a forensic biologist. So that means that I look at evidence uh, for the presence of bodily fluids, such as blood and semen. I can also perform DNA analysis, a DNA analysis if necessary. Okay. Um, what sort of training or background do you have to be able to do this sort of work as a forensic biologist? I received a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Georgia in 1995, and that was in biology. Um, soon after that, I began working at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, which is where the majority of my training occurred. How long did you work for the GBI? I worked for the GBI for approximately 11 years. After leaving the GBI, what sort of work did you start doing? After leaving the GBI, I started working at the Defense Forensic Science Center in May of 2006 basically doing the same thing. The Defense Forensic Science Center is the crime lab for the military, so now I work on cases that happen on military bases or are involved with military individuals. You said now, so are you still doing that as of today? Yes, ma'am. Um, now, in addition to your bachelor's degree, you said you received most of your training from the GBI. Tell, us, tell the jury what kind of training the GBI specifically does for their forensic biologists. Okay. Uh, when I graduated from college, I started at the GBI in September of 1995. I was an intern there in the fingerprint section, and then I was a technician in the toxicology section. Um, it wasn't until July of 1997 that I became a forensic biologist in the serology uh, DNA branch of the laboratory. Uh, once I started there, I was trained in serology, which is the identification of bodily fluids. Uh, at the time, we had tests for blood, semen, and saliva. Uh, when I started my training, I was assigned a primary trainer, and it was his job to explain to me um, the type of test to, to perform, as well as how to interpret the results. Um, I went through several written and oral exams, which I passed successfully. I also was given a set of what we call practical samples, which I had to use my training to obtain 100% accuracy on the samples. Um, my trainer knew the results, but I did not. Um, I did obtain 100% accuracy on that test as well. Uh, soon after that, I began doing serology analysis only on cases that came into the laboratory. Uh, and then a year later, I started DNA training. It followed basically the same uh, idea. I had written exams, oral exams, which I passed successfully. And then at the end, was given a set of samples in which I had to obtain 100% accuracy, and I did. Um, every year since I have been trained, I also have to perform DNA analysis on what's called a proficiency test. It's an outside company that sends in samples, and again, I have to obtain 100% accuracy, and I have done that approximately twice a year since I've been in the field in 1997. So in 2019, most of us have heard of DNA, kind of had a basic understanding, but what is the difference between serology and DNA? So serology is the identification of bodily fluids. So there are tests that I can perform to say that something is semen or something is saliva or blood. Uh, DNA analysis is actually taking that testing a step further and looking to see if I can determine who the donor of those fluids uh, may be. All of those fluids have DNA in them, so I can perform DNA, DNA analysis on those fluids and go from there. Is there any way to leave your DNA behind on a particular piece of evidence without leaving fluids as you just discussed? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us what that is? Uh, typically, it's through touch. Okay. Um, now, throughout the course of your career with both the GBI and as um, with the Army, Department of Defense, have you had an occasion to test items for what we call touch DNA? Yes, ma'am. Any way for you to estimate for us how many items you've tested for touch DNA over the years? I mean, I can't give you an accurate estimate, but I would say at least a thousand. Most of that was with the Defense Forensic Science Center. Have you ever had an occasion to testify as an expert in the field of forensic biology? Yes, ma'am. And any idea how many times you testify as an expert in the field of forensic biology? Uh, approximately 175. Um, Judge, at this time, we would tender as an expert in the field of forensic biology. We would agree that she's an expert. All right, she's admitted. <laughs> Back in 2005, where were you working? 
I was working at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation in the Division of Forensic Sciences, or the GBI Crime Lab. Did you have an occasion to work on any items that related to the disappearance of a female by the name of Tara Grinstead? Yes, ma'am, I did. Specifically, what was the first piece of evidence that you looked at in this case? Do you recall? The first piece of evidence that I tested was a portion of a latex glove. marked as state's exhibits 28, 29, and 91. I'll change it. May I approach the witness? You may. I'm going to show you what's been previously marked as state's exhibit 28, 29, and 91. Ask you to take a look at this for me, please. Now, I know it's been a while since you worked for the GBI, but did the GBI have a certain protocol as to how evidence was to be maintained before it came to the crime lab? Um, when evidence was submitted to the crime lab, it was required to be in a sealed condition. If it was not sealed appropriately, would that have been indicated on a report related to the item? There would have been some notation. I'm not sure exactly um, back then how it would have been done, but there would have been either notes in our laboratory system or a report would have been generated to that effect. Does the GBI crime lab also assign its own case number as it relates to um, each case that y'all test items for? Yes, ma'am. And with taking a look at one of your reports, refresh your recollection on what the case number was for this particular case? I actually know the case number. Well, I'm impressed. Okay, so tell us what that case number is. It's 2005-102570. Okay, so the exhibit that you have in front of you, that being state's exhibit 28, 29, and 91, did you have any occasion to work on any of those items related to the disappearance of Yes, it's the same case number. And based on that, are you able to tell us whether or not that is, in fact, those are about pictures of the glove um, that you tested? Yes, it appears to be. Your Honor, this time I will tender to evidence dates exhibits 28, 29, and 91. Any objection? No, sir. All right, there in a minute. <coughs> Take this from you. Mr. Rigby has better luck with his equipment than I have. I did not. Um, however, this particular picture, um, is that consistent, um, I guess the, actual, <coughs> the scale that we see there, is that something that's commonly used to show the actual size of items? Yes, ma'am. And then states exhibit 91, which is also been tendered. Um, again, would that be that same glove, just without the scale? Yes, it has the same case number attached to it. Now, you mentioned earlier that you tested a portion of the glove. Can you tell us why it was that you tested only a portion of this particular glove? In this instance, uh, I believe that this particular item, being the glove, um, was going to have some other testing done on it, um, fingerprint analysis, for example. Um, so I was given just a portion uh, for DNA analysis that would not interfere with any latent print or fingerprint analysis. So let me ask you, your knowledge now of touch DNA, if they attempt to lift fingerprints from something, can that remove the touch DNA? It can. Uh, there are processes in place uh, with latent print technology that we can um, try to limit that. Um, but yes, the, the latent print testing can remove DNA. And then the other way around, if you swab something for DNA, is the possibility you're going to mess up the print itself? Yes, ma'am. I actually tested the portion, um, it looks like the fingers of the glove had been cut, 
and then there's kind of an upside down U portion of the glove. Yes, That's the portion that I tested, which is basically this part of the glove. So in this particular case, I took a swab. It's basically a cotton uh, Q-tip type swab, uh, wet it with some sterile water, and then I just rubbed it along the surface of that middle portion um, of the glove on both sides. Um, once you do that swab, use the swab to obtain that, what process is used to see if there is, in fact, any human DNA on that swab? Uh, when I perform DNA analysis, uh, the first step is to actually take an item, and in this case, the swab that I took, um, treat it with chemicals. I put it into a tube first, treat it with chemicals um, to extract any DNA. Um, there are several components to a cell, uh, but the DNA is the portion that I'm concerned with. So this extraction process actually pulls the DNA out of the cells and cleans up the rest of the sample so that at the end of the extraction, I'm left with a tube that just has DNA in it. Uh, the next step is to see how much DNA I have. And after that, I then quantify it and then put it on a genetic analyzer. Um, Back in 2005, uh, the genetic analyzer would give me information at 13 areas of someone's DNA profile. How many areas are there total? Oh, there's thousands, okay. tens of thousands, but we're looking at 13 areas okay. where individuals can be um, unique or be different. Um, because we are all humans, two eyes, nose, mouth, much of our DNA is actually the same. So this is 13 areas where we can actually differ that we're looking at. Um, that was done on the swab from the glove, um, and it can also be done on samples from individuals for comparison. How do we normally obtain the sample from the individual for comparison? Typically, if there's someone uh, that law enforcement wants us to compare to something, uh, a DNA profile from a piece of evidence, it's either a blood sample or a swab from inside of their cheek. You can go ahead. Um, what do we call the swabs from the cheek usually? They're either called buccal or buccal swabs. Is it spelled differently? No, just depends on where you're from as to how you pronounce it. Kind of like pecan and pecan? Exactly. Okay. Um, so in looking at this particular sample, um, the swab that you did from that portion of this glove, were there, was there any DNA, human DNA found? Yes, ma'am. Um, and are you able to tell us if that was from one person or more than one person? Uh, the DNA I, I obtained from the swab of the glove uh, appeared to be from two individuals. And again, because most of us watch shows like CSI and, and those sorts of things, we have an idea in our heads of, of what you're looking at. But let me tell you, let me ask you, are you able to tell anything identifying about the persons based on the DNA sample? No, ma'am. Uh, are you, however, able to do a comparison to see if it matches someone's DNA? Yes. In this particular case, did you have any comparisons that were used to determine if Tara Grimstead's DNA existed on that glove? Um, I was given a toothbrush uh, that supposedly belonged to her, and I performed DNA analysis on that toothbrush and developed a profile for comparison. Okay. And, and to be clear, you said supposedly belonged to her. Do you have any reason yes. to doubt that? No. Okay. But did you personally collect that toothbrush? No, ma'am, I did not. However, has, was that toothbrush used as a known reference sample for Tara Grinstead? Yes, ma'am. And when um, that toothbrush was compared to the DNA sample found on the piece of the glove, was there a match? Yes, ma'am, there was. Based on the information you received from the agents who collected the toothbrush and your, um, <coughs> your work as a scientist, are you able to tell this jury whether or not Tara Grinstead's DNA was found on that glove? Yes, I'm able to determine uh, basically a frequency of occurrence of how rare her DNA profile is. The other DNA sample that existed, um, were you able to tell whether it was a male, female, adult, anything of that nature? I was able to determine that it was a male. How do you determine that it's a male? So I talked about the 13 areas uh, that we look at on a DNA profile. There's actually a 14th um, that tells us what gender 
a DNA profile is. So I knew I had a mixture of two individuals, and I was able to determine um, that one of those profiles matched Tara Grinstead or the DNA profile from that toothbrush. Um, but at that area where um, I can determine gender, there was a Y chromosome, and Y chromosomes are only found in males. So I deduced at that point that the other individual was a male. Now, we've been talking about DNA, and, and I kind of want to clarify. In 2005, um, where did we obtain, for at least for criminal justice purposes, the majority of the DNA from items that were recovered by law enforcement? Uh, most of our evidence samples, we got DNA from the bodily fluids that I talked about, blood, semen, saliva. Okay. This idea of touch DNA, um, was that a kind of science that was normal in 2005? No, ma'am. What about now in 2019? It's predominantly the type of samples I test now. Okay. Um, and have you ever testified in court as it relates to touch DNA? Yes, ma'am. Um, and have you, I know you say you testified mostly in military courts. Do you know if you've ever testified in Georgia courts about touch DNA? Not that I can recall offhand, no ma'am. Touch DNA, and again, I know that that sounds very simple, but can you explain to the jury what you actually mean by touch DNA? Um, it's pretty much what it sounds like. If someone touches an item, uh, their DNA can be left behind. Um, that doesn't mean I'm going to always be able to get a DNA profile. There are several different uh, factors that affect whether I can get a DNA profile. Just because I touched right there, if I take a swab and swab it like I did the glove, I may not see my DNA, but that could be because I washed my hands right before I came in. So there are several different factors um, with regarding touch DNA, but basically it's just if someone touches something, there's a possibility that I could get their DNA profile. And what kind of cells are you looking at when you're looking at touch DNA? Uh, when we get DNA profiles from when someone touches something, it's what's called epithelial cells, which is a skin cell, basically. Uh, just sort of a, I guess let me kind of ask a question. If I were to, me personally, if I were to put my hands around your neck and then put on a pair of gloves, would you expect to see my DNA on the inside of that glove? There is a possibility that it would be there. Again, like I just talked about, there's not really any hard and fast rule for touch DNA, even though we're doing a lot of touch DNA. The research out there doesn't have a hard and fast rule that if you touch something, it's definitely going to transfer. But it is a possibility. If I were, again, to put my hands around your neck and then put on a pair of gloves, is it possible to find your DNA on the inside of that glove? Yes, ma'am. Even though you never touch the inside of the glove? That's correct. Um, at that point, would you expect to find a mixture of that DNA? Yes, ma'am. And I know you said there's no hard and fast rule. However, let me ask you this. Are you more likely to find that sort of transfer of DNA that I was just discussing when there's more friction involved? Yes, typically more friction leaves more DNA. Now, during the time period that you were at the GBI, did you have an occasion to test any known um, DNA samples that were brought to you by the GBI agents to see if it matched the male DNA on that glove? Yes, ma'am. I tested several. When you say several, any idea how many you actually tested? I would say probably 10 to 20. Okay. And how, we kind of go back, when did you leave the GBI? I left the GBI, uh, my last day was at the end of April of 2006. Okay. So, do you know when you first tested the, this glove? I tested it uh, October of 2005, October 31st, I believe. So from the end of October 2005 until the April of 2006? Yes, ma'am. Um, you tested, you said several, maybe 10 unknown persons to see if they matched. Yes, ma'am. Did anybody that you tested match the DNA that was on that glove? No, ma'am. And I guess it might be more specific, the male DNA that was on that glove? No, ma'am. Um, did you test any other items in this case um, to find if there was any DNA present? I did. And can you tell us specifically, did you ever test a comforter that was brought to you by the agents in this case? I did. Okay. And what did you test on that comforter? What was it that you were testing? I tested for the presence of blood.
you test for the presence of blood on a comforter of this nature, do you actually get the whole comforter yes. across the lab? Yes. Um, do you test the whole comforter? I test anything when I when I get an item like that. I usually requested to test for the presence of blood or semen, there's, there's usually a specific request made. Um, so in this particular case, when a request is made to look for blood, I'm testing anything that looks like blood, a reddish brown stain, anything like that. To be perfectly honest, I haven't uh, been able to obtain my notes for the comforter, so I don't have any recollection of exactly what it looked like. Okay. And without it having the case number there, I can't really answer that. Understand. Um, so then let me ask you this. So that particular item that you're looking at, um, can you look at that and with your eyes say, oh yes, that's blood? No. I can tell you that it's reddish brown staining, but I would have to perform some chemical tests to actually say whether it's blood or not. When you test blood, are you able to tell us whether or not it's human blood versus, say, deer blood? Well, I can test it and tell you whether it's human or non-human. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a test for human blood typically, um, or I guess sometimes we don't actually do the human test anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we can go straight forward and perform DNA because that's going to let us know whether it's human or not also. Okay. Did you do that back in 05? I did not. I did test for the presence of human blood. Okay. And the comforter that you tested related to this case, um, can you tell us if it tested positive for the presence of human blood? Yes, ma'am, it did. Now, um, I, I know you were not there for very long after this case occurred. Um, do you know if it was ever tested and compared to Tara Grinstead? I do not. No, ma'am. Do you have any idea how many times you had tested for touch DNA prior to this case? I actually don't remember uh, any times performing touch DNA because it was something so new. Um, I had tested items, um, for instance, like a baseball cap left at a robbery scene. I've tested it for what we call wearer DNA, but that's actually more DNA than what a typical touch leaves. No further questions. Fox. Thank you. And just would she be free to go? Any objection to she? All right, you're excused. We call you next, wouldn't it? State calls Ashley Eagle. You saw me swear from the testimony you're about to be before the court in this case be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us your name, please, ma'am? Ashley Hinkle. You'll spell your first and last name for the court for please. A-S-H-L-E-Y-H-I-N-K-L-E. -E. And Ms. Hinkle, how are you employed? I'm employed at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation in the Forensic Biology Section in Decatur, Georgia. How long have you been employed with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation uh, in the Forensic Biology Section? Uh, approximately 12 and a half years. Now, Ms. Hinkle, if you will give the jury the benefit of your training and experience to allow you to do your job as a forensic biologist. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from East Carolina University and a Master's of Science in Forensic Science from Marshall University, as well as extensive in-house training at GBI and the National Forensic Science Technology Center in Largo, Florida. Now, uh, with regard to being a forensic biologist, if you will, tell us what you do as a forensic biologist. Uh, primarily, my job as a forensic biologist is to examine evidence for the presence of bodily fluids. If those are found, I attempt to attain a DNA profile, and I compare, compare that profile to reference samples that have been submitted from individuals. Now, when we talk about um, uh, bodily fluids, when we say bodily fluids, what kind of bodily fluids are you looking for? Uh, blood, semen, or saliva. We also test contact DNA. Now, with regard to 
talk about DNA. What, what exactly is DNA? Yeah, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's found throughout our bodies in what's called our cells. It gives us unique characteristics, such as the color of our eyes or the color of our hair. No two people have the same DNA, except for identical siblings. And we get half from our mother and half from our father. Right. Now, with regard to uh, the uh, testing and training that you've done there at the crime lab, have you testified as an expert in the field of forensic biology uh, before today? Uh, yes, I have. And do you recall how many times you've done that? This evening? Approximately 140. Now, uh, this, uh, Judge, this time we would tender Ms. Hinkle as an expert in forensic biology. <coughs> All right, she's admitted as an expert. Now, uh, <coughs> Ms. Hinkle, what, what kind of testing do you do for uh, uh, looking for something for DNA and in the comparison of, of that DNA? What do you do? What kind of testing do you do? Uh, do you want me to take you through the steps? Yes, ma'am, please. Sorry. Yes. Uh, we, question. we perform a testing, a DNA typing. We take a small amount of a sample, we put it in a tube. We add liquids to separate the DNA from the other biological material that's present. We use a robot to assist in this step. We then quantitate the amount of DNA that's present to tell us if we actually obtain DNA from the item. These, uh, this DNA is then copied on an instrument, the PCR. Uh, we make copies along the DNA strand. Uh, these copies are separated on an instrument called a genetic analyzer. And from the genetic analyzer, we actually get the data we've used in a software program. Uh, and that provides us a DNA profile. Then we physically have to compare uh, an unknown sample or sample from evidence to reference samples. Now, with regard to this case involving uh, the disappearance of Ms. Tara Grinstead, were you asked to look at uh, items of evidence in this case for comparison for DNA purposes? Uh, yes, I was. I started on this case around 2010. Right. Now, with regard uh, to that, uh, Ms. Hinkle, I'm going to show you I'm going to show you several photographs. States exhibits 28, 29, and 91. And ask if you'll look at those, please, ma'am. Are you familiar with what's shown in those photographs? I haven't actually seen these photos before. Okay. Uh, do you recognize, that with regard to uh, items of evidence, do they have a specific uh, case number associated with the case? Uh, yes, I do recognize the uh, GBI case number 2005-1025070. Okay. And with regard to uh, that particular uh, case number, is that associated to a particular case involving the disappearance of Tara Grinstead? Yes, sir. Uh, with regard to that, did you test uh, a glove with regard to uh, Ms. Greenstead? Uh, yes, I did. All right. Now, with regard to the glove, that, 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 um, it is that similar to the glove that's, that's shown in those photographs? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Yes. Now, with regard to uh, that particular glove, what were you asked to do originally with, with your testing regarding uh, results from Ms. Ellis or Ms. Hopgood Ellison that used to work at the lab? when you uh, got this, and I'll refer you, just so we're clear, I know you a bunch of reports. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to refer you to your report, um, Ms. Hinkle, dated June the 10th of 2015, okay? Uh, what were you asked to do with regard to uh, this item, with regard to the results from uh, Ms. Hopgood or Ellison's report back from then? Um, at that time, we it was requested that we send off uh, DNA to testing for what's called phenotype testing. Uh, phenotype testing is different than what we do at GBI, but it helps to give an image of who the DNA belongs to. Uh, they use certain factors that tell you the color of the hair, whether someone has a cleft chin, uh, ethnicity of an individual. So that was requested. Um, I had to actually retest the glove because they needed a sample that had around 90% from the unknown male. And the sample that had been previously tested by Ms. Hobgood had 
there was about a 50-50 mixture. Okay. And so when you retested the sample, do you recall what portion of the glove it was that you retested? I tested a portion of the glove. Okay. Put it on the screen for you if you'd like. You can see the, the middle part around the knuckles is what... Oh uh, yes, that middle area is around the the knuckles. It's or the top of the palm of the hand. It's not really the knuckles. It's the top of the palm of the hand. Uh, it's the what we were provided for DNA testing. Okay, so just so we're clear, there there are items up here that look like fingertips. Is yep. that the item you tested? No. And regarding, there's a long strip at the bottom. Is that the item you tested? No, sir. Now this item here is that. Is that the item you're referring to? Oh uh, yes, that's what I tested. Uh, that was <laughs> I successfully obtained a profile from. Those other items, they actually were tested, but it was after the late <coughs> prints processing, and I wasn't able to obtain any DNA for uh, the the phenotype testing. Now, with regard to the testing that you performed, with regard to that that particular area of this glove, uh, uh, did you perform those tests as you previously described for us? Uh, yes. And did you perform those uh, in the manner in which your, your protocol and procedures require? Uh, yes, I did. And it, what were you able to determine from your testing <coughs> with regard to that area of the glove? Uh, I actually tested it separately. I took swabbings from what was the inner portion of the glove and the outer portion of the glove. These may not actually be the inner and outer portion of the glove. It was just as I received it. Um, from the inner portion, I obtained a DNA profile that was of two individuals. And from the outer, I obtained a DNA profile that was from three individuals. Now, with regard to the inner <coughs> profile that you talked about, you said that you had a profile of two individuals. Is that right? Correct. Now, with regard to your testing, were you able to, uh, did you have a known sample uh, for your testing from uh, Ms. Tara Grinstead? Uh, yes. I did. Um, at that time, we used uh, Ms. Grinstead's toothbrush. Now, with regard to uh, the known sample from Tara Grinstead, did you also, uh, and this may be in a different report, at, at some time have, uh, in, in, like I believe your report is July of 2016, did you receive a uh, vocal swab sample of known DNA from a, from a person known as Bo Dukes? Uh, yes, I did. All right. And with regard to the two individuals that were found on that inner portion of the glove in your testing, did you make any determination of whether that uh, would, that individual, uh, with, with regard to those two individuals, were you able to make a determination as to Mr. Bodukes? Uh, it did not match Mr. Bodukes. And with regard to uh, Ms. Tara Grinstead, with regard to the known sample from her toothbrush, um, what did your uh, test and findings indicate? Uh, from the known sample from the toothbrush, there was a partial profile from the inside of the glove. Uh, it matched uh, the Ms. Grinstead, and approximately one in 900 individuals would also have that profile. Now, with regard to um, later, um, let me say, I think it's... Uh, Direct material report, which is yeah, the same one. Sorry, same one. Uh, with regard to your report, and the report date uh, is uh, February twenty fourth, two thousand and seventeen. Um, at this time, did you receive a known buckle swab or DNA sample from someone known as Ryan Alexander Duke? Oh, uh, yes, I did. Now, with regard to the um, known sample of Ryan Alexander Duke, did you compare that to the uh, known profile uh, from this portion of the glove, the other individual that, that was there? Oh, uh, yes, I did. And if you will, did you perform your testing uh, according to the procedures you've already described for us? Uh, yes, sir. And if you will give us the results of your testing against the known uh, DNA sample of Ryan Alexander Duke and uh, the uh, in other individual on this glove besides Ms. Grinstead. Uh, the inner piece of glove, the primary profile, matched the DNA profile of Ryan Alexander Duke. And with regard to um, the profile of Ryan Alexander Duke, we're able to determine a frequency with regard to uh, that. Yeah, the, the 
Uh, frequency of finding this profile randomly in the general population would be one in 300 quadrillion individuals. Now, I, I'm not good at numbers, and I'll, I'll just tell you that, that up front, but when you say quadrillion, what, what does that mean? Well, quadrillion is 15 zeros, and since it's 300, you would add two more, so it would be 17 zeros. Uh, there's only about 7 billion people in the population of the Earth, and 7 billion, that's nine zeros. So this is more than the population of anyone or, or the number of people on, on planet Earth? Correct. Uh, yes, I am. And when I say touch DNA, can you tell me what I'm talking about? Uh, touch DNA, uh, another name for it is contact DNA. It's not from a biological fluid such as blood, semen, or saliva. It's mainly skin cells. Uh, if I were to touch this area right here, I could leave some of my DNA, or I could, I could actually not leave some of my DNA. Okay. But, Sorry. but this would be a touch item as far as evidence. Now, with regard to uh, touch DNA, are you familiar with, uh, have you testified before about touch DNA and admitting that into evidence? Oh, uh, yes, I have. Uh, now, Ms. Hinkle, through uh, your uh, time at the crime lab, did, did y'all also uh, have a comforter that you tested for uh, the presence of blood? Not, not that you specifically did it, but was there a comforter there that was tested for blood as well? Uh, yes, there was. All right. And was there another analyst there at the, the, uh, the lab that tested uh, that blood for, for uh, Ms. Grinstead's blood? Is that right? Uh, it was another analyst, yes. Okay. And it was found to be Ms. Grinstead's blood? Uh, yes. And I, can I add that actually at the time of the Parabon testing, we did need a known sample of Ms. Grinstead, so it was a cutting from a comforter that we used in order to provide a known sample because by that time, there wasn't enough DNA left on the toothbrush. Okay, and with regard to uh, that specific sample of being Ms. Grinstead's blood on the comforter, and I, and I apologize for this question, I just don't, I don't know how else to ask it, are you able to tell the difference of, of the, the source of the blood or the kind of blood that it is uh, that kind of uh, no, I can't tell if it's blood from a struggle, if it's blood from a nosebleed, or if it's menstrual blood. I don't have anything further to say. Mr. Thomas. My name is Jesse Worley. It's J E S S E W O R L E Y. And Worley, how are you currently employed? I am a latent fingerprint examiner at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation in the Division of Forensic Sciences, which is the state crime lab. What sort of background or training do you have to be a latent forensic examiner? I have a Bachelor's of Science in Forensic and Investigative Sciences from West Virginia University. 
After my graduation, I was hired by the GBI and I completed approximately a two-year training program um, designed by the GBI to, to complete latent print casework. And then um, at the completion of my training, I am still required to do at least uh, 16 hours of additional training every year. Have you, over your time, uh, sorry, tell me again, how long have you been with the GBI? I was hired in 2007. Since 2007, have you actually had an occasion to test items of evidence against and compare them to known samples? Yes, I have. Any idea how many times you've done that? A lot. Um, I work on average um, 30 cases a month, so 30 cases a month for about 10 years. Um, have you ever testified in the field of latent print examination? Yes, I have. And just to be clear, latent print examination and latent print comparisons are those the same thing, or is comparing part of the examination? Um, the way the GBI delegates or delineates our casework, examination um, is the portion of our work that would include comparisons, but we also do uh, what we refer to as processing services as well as database services as well. Okay, so when I use the term latent print examination, um, for you, does that sort of include everything that you do? Yes. Um, and again, have you had an occasion to testify on all of those things um, previously? Yes, I have. And have you been tendered as an expert in the field of latent print examination previously? Yes. Any idea how many times? About 58. I think today is 59, if that goes that way. Um, have those all been in the state of Georgia? Yes. Um, have those been in superior courts of Georgia? Yes, and once in federal court. Judge, at this time, we would tend to her as an expert in the field of latent print examination. Judge, I actually tried the federal case when she was sworn as an expert. I was familiar with her CV and she didn't know what she was doing. All right, she's admitted as an expert. Small world. It's funny. Um, in this particular case, were you assigned... It's my understanding uh, that yet the glove was submitted to the GBI crime lab and was worked by uh, a different examiner at the time, um, but they would have followed similar protocols to those that were in place after I was hired. Now, when we say latent prints, what is, like, what is a latent print? Uh, latent prints are those that are typically left behind when a person touches or handles an object with their hands. Um, what we look for in latent prints are what are also referred to as friction ridge impressions. And friction ridges are made, those impressions are made when the friction ridge skin of your hands, which you can also find on the soles of your feet, um, comes in contact with the surface and transfers some residue like sweat or dirt or blood or any other kind of contaminant from the surface of your skin onto the object or surface that you touched. Um, you can kind of relate it to the idea of a rubber stamp. If you have a stamp, you put ink on it, and you place it on a sheet of paper, you make a copy of the stamp. Um, the friction ridge skin on your hands is composed of a, a series of ridges that make different patterns and contain different features that can be used for comparison. The handling of the object creates that transfer of residue from the skin to the surface, and then it's that latent print that may not be visible that in the lab we can use different development techniques, different chemicals or powders to make it visible and then compare it to known sources. Why is it that we use print examination in the world of criminal forensic science? Um, so fingerprint comparisons and identifications are based on two premises. One is that your fingerprints or a person's fingerprints are unique to that individual. Um, that arrangement of features and patterns that are found in your fingerprints aren't going to be found replicated in another person. Um, so if a fingerprint can be identified, it's going to be identified to one source and not multiple source sources. What if you have an identical twin? Uh, research that's been published shows that even identical twins who may share DNA have different fingerprints. Okay. What is the second premise? The second premise is that arrangement of those features and details that are in your fingerprint patterns is permanent over your lifetime. Um, fingerprints are formed in utero, so they're already formed before a baby is even born. 
and then that arrangement stays essentially the same. It you know, grows bigger as a child grows to adulthood, but that arrangement of those features stays the same. Now, there are times when injury or certain diseases can impact the arrangement of those features or their appearance, um, but even still at that point, sometimes the injury makes it even more unique. Um, certain scars can become a permanent feature and they can also be used in comparison. Um, but because they don't change, they're expected to be the same, even if you're using um, comparison or known exemplars from a number of years ago or in an instance like this when they're being used a number of years after the latent prints were deposited on the evidence. Okay. And so you, you referenced in this case, let me go back. The, can you see what's depicted on the screen in front of you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, does any part of that glove still exist in order to be able to obtain latent prints? Um, no, not really. Um, the, at the time when I saw this glove, um, I did have it in my custody at the lab for a period of time. Um, but the, the latex or the rubber material that that particular glove is made out of has degraded over the years. Um, and it's in a lot of small pieces, kind of the idea of you put a piece of paper through a cross-cut shutter, it's, it's small. There's not a lot of usable surface area left. So then how are you able to do a print comparison you know, 12 plus years later, or nearly 12 years later? Um, the GBI protocols that, fo that were followed um, at the time the examination was begun in 2005, um, the latent print examiner that worked the case did a series of chemical enhancements to, or applied a series of chemical enhancements to the surface of this item. Um, all of our results of fingerprint development or latent print development are photographed. So the photographs that were taken in 2005 were still available for me to use, um, I guess, in 2018. And with these photographs, are they su sufficient that you can actually get the kind of detail that you were discussing earlier with the fingerprint? It, it was sufficient. Um, in, of course, in the last 12 years, imaging technology and digital photography has improved significantly. So it may not have been in as ideal a condition as would have been available today using the cameras with the number of megapixels that are available. Um, so it may be less than ideal for what today's standards would be, but they were still usable um, to do comparisons with, yes. No. We've been talking about prints, and most people have heard of a fingerprint, we kind of think of that. Is that the only kind of print that you use for comparison in cases? Um, so like I said, you have friction ridge skin that covers it's pretty, the entire palmar surface of your hand. So from the tips of your fingers all the way down to where your wrist um, bends, you actually, we refer to it as bracelet creases, um, but you have friction ridge skin that entire surface. Same thing on the soles of your feet. From the tips of your toes all the way back around your heel is the same ridged skin. Um, so typically as a latent print examiner, when we refer to fingerprints or latent prints, we all automatically think of fingers because that's the, the area that's most commonly recorded and stored for comparison and identification purposes. But in actuality, you can compare any area of friction ridge skin. So even the lower joints of your fingers or any areas of the palms can also be compared and identified. In this particular case, um, did you review the work that was done by the initial latent print examiner back in F5? I reviewed portions of the initial step of our evaluation or examination process, which is referred to as an analysis. Okay. Um, I reviewed the results of the analysis. I did not duplicate any of the comparisons that would have already been reported. Um, I did additional comparisons to the new exemplars that were submitted um, in 2018. When you say exemplars, what do you mean by that? Exemplars are our known source recordings, so fingerprints or palm print records that are attributed and already known to have come from a particular individual. So am I understanding you to say that you duplicated the portion to determine if there was a usable print, but not any of the comparisons that may have been done to persons of interest throughout the years? Right, that's correct. So I, what I did essentially was go back and look at, well, the initial examiner indicated that there were latent prints that were of value for comparison. So I tried to locate as best as possible from old notes which prints or impressions he would have been referring to in his notes. Um, at that point, I did my own analysis to determine if by today's standards at the lab or today's uh, procedures and policies that they would in fact still be something we would compare 
And my, as far as the glove is concerned, I did conclude that they were suitable for comparison and then proceeded with the comparisons to the new exemplars. Was there any, I mean, any um, difference between the comparisons that you did um, recently and the compare, I'm using the word comparison, sorry, let me go back. The examination you did recently to the examination that was done by the original fingerprint, uh, or excuse me, the original latent print examiner back in 05. Um. So overall, the process of what we look for during the analysis as far as what makes an impression of value or suitable to be used for comparison is an assessment of the amount of detail that's present in the impression. We're looking really to see is the clarity present and the quality of the impression clear enough to be able to see the features to use in a comparison, and then is there a sufficient quantity to be able to make an identification. Um, while that process in and of itself hasn't changed, some of our quality <laughs> thresholds may have been a little different in 2005 than they are in 2018. So um, that was the, uh, the first part of my examination was to assess whether or not they were going to be something I could compare according to our policy. And were your findings consistent with 2005 findings? Yes, um, both the 2005 findings and those that I had were that there, there were impressions or latent prints that could be compared. Um, in my assessment, I, d I located or identified three different areas of what appeared to be friction ridge impressions or latent prints that I determined to be suitable for comparison. Okay. I'm unsure how that may have related to the original notes. Okay. Um, now, looking at, you mentioned earlier some known exemplars. Um, when was the first time that you actually did your initial examination of this block? It was in November of 2018. And since that time, were you provided certain exemplar, exemplars to compare to the three prints you found on this block? Um, in November of 2018, I was provided with the, um, the glove and the photographs that were taken in 2005. And I was asked to compare them to two different individuals that were named on one of our uh, GBI evidence submission forms. Um, the submission forms came with ID numbers that I used to retrieve the known exemplars from the state database. Okay. And who were those two persons that you were asked to compare? Sorry, just one minute. Um, the names as they appeared on the exemplars were Bo Dukes and Ryan Alexander Duke. Based on the two exemplars that you were given, did either of those two persons match to the three latent prints you found were suitable for comparison? Um, in the course of my examination, I was able to utilize a comparison um, software program to aid my examination and comparison due to the difficulty and the complexity of the, ex the impressions from the glove. Um, I put both sets of the exemplars into the software as well as the three areas of friction ridge impressions from the glove, and I used the computer to do an automated comparison process. Um, the comparison process or the computer software brings back um, areas of potential similarity between the latent prints and the known exemplars. Uh, which helps to narrow down and limit the amount of searching or manual searching to do in the palm areas. Um, when talking about latent print comparisons, the finger areas are fairly limited in terms of the size and volume and amount of ridge detail present. But when you start comparing the area of a single finger to the area available in a palm print, you go from having, you know, um, a one half square inch area to several square inches of space to search and it can become a lot of work um, and a lot of area to search and it can be difficult sometimes depending on how limited the detail in the latent print may be uh, which was what drove me to make the decision uh, to use the computer software to help automate that process. Um, once I had the latent prints and the exemplars in the computer program and the search program had run its course, I did comparisons of what it brought back as areas of potential match and evaluated each of those areas against the latent prints. 
Um, as a result of those searches that I did on the computer program, I was able to identify two of the impressions from the glove to one of the individuals whose exemplars I had put into the computer. And who, which individual's prints matched? The identifications were made to the palm prints um, that had the name Ryan Alexander Duke. Were any of the prints that were found on this glove, have they been matched to or um, seem to be from the person known as Bejuks? No. Now you've mentioned two of the three. Let's talk about that third one. At this point, are you able to scientifically tell us if that print matches any known exemplar you've been given? Not at the time in November when I did the initial examination, no. Okay. Can you tell us that now? No, the answer is still no. Um, I did additional comparisons to that remaining print again in February of this year. Um, the results of my additional comparisons, however, are still inconclusive. Okay, so let me be clear. Are they inconclusive as to everybody or are they inconclusive as to one person? Because I only compared one person, they're inconclusive to that one Was that compared to those No. Um, was that compared to Ryan Duke? Yes. Um, but again, are you able to exclude that as being from Ryan Duke? No. Are you able to exclude that or say that that's Ryan Duke's? No. Um, but the two that had sufficient detail for comparison, are you able to tell this jury, um, based on your expertise, who those prints belong to that came from the glove? Yes. And who was that? Uh, they were made by the same source as the prints that are on the cards that had the name Ryan Alexander Duke. So all three I determined to be suitable for comparison. There is enough in all three to, to be able to compare them. The two I was able to identify to the cards that had the name Ryan Alexander Duke. So in theory, that rules out being from another source. Um, the third one, my results were inconclusive. That's correct. Thank you. Anything from? Yeah. All right, you step down. Thank you. Read, she can't be excused. Mr. Gregory, can she be excused? Yes, yes, Your Honor. Mr. Fox? Yes, sir. Okay. You're excused. You can call your next witness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the jury, it's uh, almost 4.30, but my understanding is that uh, the next witness would be considerably long. It's an uh, interview, and so um, I, I don't want to break that up. I, I'm, I, what I'm going to do is recess for the afternoon um, with the instructions that you're to be back here in the morning in the jury room by 9 o'clock. Um, don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't allow anyone to discuss it in your presence or in your hearing. Um, and don't discuss it among yourselves until I give you instructions to do so. Now, with those instructions, you're free to go. Be back in the jury room by 9 o'clock in the morning. Thank you.